Hello and welcome to Chemistry 30 in the AM. I'm your host, Mr. Shindelka. Pause this screen and jot these notes down here. Electrons and atoms. Take a minute, I will pause, and then continue on with electron configurations. Okay. For the recording, pause this screen and copy out electron configuration notes here. I'll just talk, talk about them real quickly now. I'm assuming that you've copied them all. Okay. Electron configurations. And this is the new stuff. Describes how electrons of an atom fill the cell phones. And in physics, it's called quantum mechanics. It states that each orbital can only have two electrons. It's the Pauli exclusion. You don't have to remember that. It's called the Pauli exclusion principle. But do remember, each orbital can only have two electrons. Electrons start filling at the lowest energy orbitals and then continue to the next orbital with the second lowest energy. That's called the outbound principle. You don't have to remember that it's the outbound principle. <coughs> you do remember it goes from low to high energy. Then Hunt's rule is electrons don't pair up unless all the orbitals at a given sublevel already have one electron. Sort of like when we were doing the dots, you know, single, 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 and then double them up after. Singles first, then pair up after. Okay? I'll let those disappear. Another thing is, is electron configurations. We will only do what we, I say is predicted electron configurations. There's exceptions that don't follow the pattern, but we won't consider them in our class. That means if you Googled up, and I often give ones that don't follow the pattern, but I want you to follow the pattern, and if you Googled up something like, um, oh, I don't know, maybe if you had uh, uranium or something like this, and you just Googled it up and wrote down that answer, that's not doing what I predicted, or that we're using these predicted rules. So don't Google up and think those are the correct answers. We're only doing predicted patterns, okay? Now, the next thing that I'm going to show you in the next few slides is not notes. Don't copy these down. I'm just going to show you a little bit. So, the shapes of the orbitals, interest only, not notes. There's my source. Now, I don't know if you've ever, uh, Mr. Mallet has them at the back of his classroom on top of, high up on top of his cabinets. I think he, used, he still does. He has the shapes of these orbitals on little stands. The S orbitals, he said there's S, P, Ds, and Fs. The S orbitals have this spherical shape. 2S looks like a bigger sphere. 3S looks like even bigger sphere. The P orbitals sort of look like bar or dumbbells in some ways. And there's three of them. They can just be oriented along the X axis, the Y axis, or the Z, the up and down axis. And you gotta remember that these are all superimposed in over top of each other. So with really all three of those combined. In addition, well, it's a big electron cloud. And these are just, this represents a p orbital. Those are areas where a couple of electrons could be found. Highest probability. Anyways. Here's another view of what a p orbital kind of looks like, too. And these are mathematical kind of, kind of constructs. The D orbitals have more interesting shapes. They have four lobes to them, typically. There's five different ways they can be oriented. There's the four. And then the fifth one is kind of neat. It's got like a donut in the middle, and then like that barbell shape, top and bottom. Oh, sorry, but it is. That's one orbital. 
And then you got to remember, they're all like superimposed. Those electron clouds are kind of like superimposed. There's shapes for the F orbitals, and they get more advanced. This is the one I like the best. There's seven of those. Do not make any attempt in high school to memorize those shapes. I just thought you should be aware. Now, this is where the three of you who don't have handouts, you're kind of missing something here. Now, don't worry, you don't have to jot this all out. But if you guys who do have handouts, find this sheet. I think it says electron configuration blank at the top. I'm just taking a look in Darian's handouts. You'll notice it, it's colored sheets anyways. Give you guys a moment. They're tiny. You have four on a sheet. The three people who don't have them, just in your notebook, do not draw all of this. But just as we go along. And we'll do one example. We'll do a few examples. One example, and you'll see. It'll take you guys a little longer. You don't have to have your boxes perfect and stuff that you follow along. Now, I would like to do this first example. We're using the Huns rule, the Aufbau principle, and the Pauli exclusion principle. What we just jotted notes down. We're going to try to make sense out of them. First thing I want to do is oxygen. Now, when I say oxygen, though, I mean O2, so I'm going to say an oxygen atom, so that it's clear. That means one. Oh. You look up oxygen on the periodic table, which you can't see me if I point to my periodic table. But oxygen's in the second row, number eight. I'm going to just jot this down on your periodic table here. You would find oxygen and it has an 8 above it. I wouldn't normally write that down because I'd just point to it. But anyways, that 8 is important because if it's neutral oxygen, it has 8 protons, that can't change. But what's important in chemistry is that neutral oxygen has eight electrons in one atom. And here's how we do the electron configuration and with this diagram. We start at the lowest energy level. And I'll just zip back here just a second for the rules that we're going to follow. The Pauli exclusion principle says, goes back to this here that each orbital can only have two electrons. That's what those boxes represent. And the Elschlau principle says we start at the lowest energy orbital and then go to the next lowest energy, and so on. Hunt's rule, electrons don't pair up until every electron at a sublevel has one electron. So keeping those things in mind, we'll come back to this. Okay. So an oxygen atom has eight electrons. So we start at the lowest level. And I'm going to use an arrow up and an arrow down. But instead of doing an arrow like this and an arrow like that, it gets too messy in those little boxes. So I use a half arrow up, arrow down like this. Okay, I'm going to erase that. That's just to make it bigger. I'm going to put it into this box. So the first two electrons are from the first row. One. Two. I've filled that up to max. I go to the next lowest energy level, which happens to be going up 2s. I have these in order of energy. 3, 4. Okay? And then 8. So I'm at 4. I need 4 more. So I say 5. Six, seven. Now I've got singles all at the same sublevel. I can now double up. 
Let's take eight. Isaac, Darian, and Tristan, you'd only need to draw this. Do not draw the rest of those boxes, okay? I don't care about the exact space either. Just as long as you get the idea you're going up into higher energy levels, okay? Everyone else has a diagram, so it's pretty simple. Now, I want to point some things out. Normally, I'd be doing this along with the periodic table if you could see at the same time. And it just occurs to me that I don't have a good periodic table to refer to. Hang on. Uh, no, that one's not good. Um, tell you what, I'll just bring up the other lesson. Okay? Okay. So we've finished up that electron configuration. I'm going to skip up, skip down, get a slide down, to iron. Now, iron, you find it in the middle of your periodic table. It's 26. So normally I just point to this on the periodic table. 26, F, E. Now, I'm going to flip to the other periodic table. Iron is right here, 26. A few things about this, because it's connected to the periodic table. Iron is in the fourth, and I didn't need to make it there, in the fourth row or period of the periodic table. That means it's going to have all of the 1s electrons filled in. All of the 2s, and then this is the 2p region. 3s, 3p, those eight electrons. There's In the rows two and three, there's eight electrons. So I'm going to blindly fill those in. 1s2, and then the 2s, 2p, those eight. 3s. 3p, that's 8 as well, and then we'll slow down and consider something when we get to 4, okay? <coughs> Pardon me. I'm actually not going to count to 26. It'll add up to 26, but you'll see maybe. So I said iron's in the fourth call or fourth row. So I know that it has everything contained in the 1 level. It has Everything in the, I got a frog in this one. Anyways, everything in the second row, that's eight electrons. I got one, two, and then these six. One, 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 then they double up. It also has all of the third rows. And that's the eight electrons, three S and three P. Now, I told you I'd stop there, and then we'll reconsider something. I'm only drawing a line here to emphasize that I've got levels or rows one, two, and three continue. Okay? Iron is in the fourth row on the periodic table. So we're really going to start at 4s. And the way this diagram is, and I know it's really small, it's like a millimeter or so. And you guys have a smaller diagram than this. But the 4s is at a lower level than the 3d. Now, it's for energy reasons that we start with 4s then 3D. And you know what? I'm going to flip back to the periodic table and point out something. The periodic table, you know how it has a big gap here in between here? 
that's sort of where these d electrons start up here. Okay? That's why there's a gap there. And when we do electron configurations, for example, the 3s, we count 3s, 1, 3s, 2. Then we skip to 3p. 3p, 1, 2, 3, 4, p5, p6. We're now getting up to iron. It happens to be at level or row 4. So we start at 4s. And there's 2. 1, 2. Then we get into the D electrons. And there are actually 3D there. It's a quantum mechanic reason why they're labeled 3D. But we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in that zone until we get up to the actual ion. Okay? So we have 1, 2, and then and 6 of the others to fill in. This is the way I'm going to try this. So two and then six. And switch bands here. And you say, well, there's a one, two, one, two. And then one, two, three, four, five, six. For the three D. That is iron's electron configura or configuration diagram. I'm going to pause for a second, and then we're going to actually I'll give to you a shortcut to do the electron configuration. The long way to do this would be to list, and I'm not suggesting you do this, I'll do it in this opinion, would be to say, okay, I got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and then 4s2, 3d, and I'm running out of space, what is it, 6, 1, 2, yeah. Anyways, don't do that. As you can see, if you're getting up to uranium or something large, like that would be a lot of writing if you're doing something in the seventh row. So we have a shortcut. Since iron is in the fourth, and I'll go back to the periodic table. Since iron is in the fourth row, we know it has all of the electrons that the third row could contain. And you know what? A complete uh, filled third row element is argon. All of these noble gases, we call them, they don't bond because they're completely filled with electrons and energetically they don't need any more. So we're going to use the shortcut and say, well, the previous noble gas, or iron, because it's in the fourth row, is the end of the third row. We're going to say argon. That's our shortcut. It has all the electrons that argon has. So here's how we notate them. say AR and that means that it contains all the electrons that are going to have it contains all of these electrons here. that's what this shortcut is for okay let me just get rid of those Then, what's important to the chemistry part of this is the electrons in the fourth row went up. So starting at 4s, I've got 4s with two electrons in the back. Then 3d. I note that there's one, two, three, four, five, six electrons, so I say 3d6. Now, I tell you what, 
This is getting, you know, you guys have been really good sports for an hour and a half here. It's 11 o'clock, so it's 5 to 11. 